Sorry about the suspense. <laughs> Thanks for waiting. Uh, welcome again to the um, uh, Hydrogen and Fuel Cells and Batteries Group Exhibit 2016. Uh, my name is Robin, and today I'm introducing um, Mr. Mark Kammerer, Business Development Manager at Hydrogen X Corporation. Thank you for joining us. Yay, I'm clapping. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, today our topic uh, with um, Hydrogen X Corporation is uh, the latest developments in fuel cells and commercial heavy duty mobility at Hydrogen X. So uh, without any further ado, uh, there has been a lot of uh, talk about your Celerity fuel cell. So can you tell us a bit about it and its uh, uh, applications? Sure, yeah, okay. The Celerity fuel cell is based on the Hydrogen X uh, heavy mobility uh, fuel cell HD type, uh, which we have now since 2003 in the market, uh, the HDs, and now uh, the Celerity we released in uh, 2014. And it's uh, designed specifically for uh, fuel cell buses and trucks, so very heavy uh, applications. And it was designed in uh, cooperation and with and for uh, Siemens, uh, who makes the electric drives for most of the fuel cell buses in the, in the market today. And will you happen to have anything to show us? <laughs> ah, as a matter of fact, uh, just a moment. <laughs> More suspense. <laughs> it's coming, I swear. You don't have to. There. Your mic's still on. In fact, I, I happen to have one right here. Ah, my, my colleague is helping me. Uh, so this is a 60 kilowatt uh, hydrogen fuel cell, uh, polymer electrolyte membrane, and the voltage is uh, 640 volts, so it overlaps the voltage range of the Siemens uh, Alpha Drive. So that means uh, they don't need a boost converter, which is a very uh, expensive piece of equipment that takes up uh, spaces and, and is also a source of potential failure. That can be eliminated because the voltage here overlaps uh, the drive voltage, and so it's a much easier and much more reliable uh, and lower cost system overall. And so hmm. its applications mainly would be for yeah, it's, uh, it's designed for the rear um, installation of uh, fuel cell buses. It can be also mounted in between uh, the cab and the uh, payload area in, in trucks. We have other fuel cells. I mean, this you would not put it on the roof on a, on a bus, uh, but we have other fuel cells which um, uh, are flat based on the same technology, uh, but flat on, uh, on the roofs of buses. So they can be either on the roof or in, in uh, some of the bus OEMs are planning articulated uh, sections where the fuel cell and hydrogen is all mounted inside. Uh, so it's in a second uh, part of the bus that uh, yeah, would bend. Specifically for yeah. that. And this yeah. is basically only for uh, vehicles then, that's what you're saying? Yeah, we have other uh, fuel cells which are in the same power range that are for stationary applications. Um, um, okay, um, I learned as well that you have a pilot project happening in Korea. Yeah, in fact, uh, interestingly enough, the, uh, the Korean, it's a large stationary um, plant of one megawatt uh, uh, electrical power. Uh, it's in fact uh, in 1.8 megawatts in total of, of gross power fuel cells, but the business case and the uh, economic driver is the efficiency. So the fuel cell is operating at partial load to maximize the, uh, the uh, electronic uh, output and because the, uh, the revenue coming in is a feed-in tariff, in, uh, which is Korea's unique to the world that has a, uh, actually has a feed-in tariff for electricity produced from fuel cells. Thank you. And uh, can you tell us about the, uh, the modules and their applications? 
Yeah, well, the uh, the modules we have, we have sizes, star, smallest is 3 kilowatts. Uh, we have uh, 4, 8, uh, 10, 12, uh, 16, 30, and then we just build them up from there into the megawatt range. So it's uh, really any so uh, power level can be achieved uh, in a very modular way. If it's a, a stationary application, it can be in a rack, so a 19-inch rack. Uh, and uh, each rack is 120 kilowatts, uh, so quite a pretty high uh, power density, and that can be in the megawatts. And this plant that uh, you were asking about in Korea, the first one I said is mag one megawatt, but that's a pilot plant. So they're planning, in fact, uh, systems in the future in uh, 10 megawatts, 20, 30, 40 megawatts. Uh, so that's where it's where it's going. And uh, any other countries apart from Korea that are using? Uh, we have the same uh, same rack in uh, the Arctic in Canada, uh, producing power for a, a nickel and silver mine. Uh, in projects in Europe uh, with fueling stations to take energy from uh, stored hydrogen from electrolyzers, uh, and then putting power back for the uh, the local users or back to the grid. Uh, there's a plant in uh, in Puglia in Italy. Uh, that is uh, taking energy from wind and solar, storing it with an electrolyzer, and, and then the fuel cells can put the power back to, uh, back to the grid, or it can be completely uh, grid independent. And any challenges that uh, you can share with us about uh, the work that Hydrogenic does, Hydrogenix? Challenges, that well, you can share. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing is, of course, uh, a lot of the projects we're doing, they've never been done before, so we're pushing the envelope to uh, further developing uh, the technology. Uh, so that in itself is the challenge to get the, the commercialization where you're doing a lot of repetitive uh, high volumes. That's starting to happen now for us in, um, in, in Germany with trains, uh, with Alstom Power, or uh, not Alstom Power, <laughs> Alstom Transport. Uh, we have a, a project that is, in fact, commercializing the fuel cells, so this basic technology here, uh, into trains where there's a commitment to already deliver uh, 60 trains within uh, Germany. So you're mentioning trains, so as far as that goes, uh, why, why fuel cell, why not just electric? Yeah, very good question. Uh, and if you have an electrified line, absolutely, electricity is the way to go. It's, it's uh, direct. Um, however, in, in Germany as well as Europe, and uh, uh, there's only about 50% of the rail lines are electric. So the inner city lines, the, within the city uh, lines, they're already electrified. Uh, but to convert the regional routes that go out into the, into the country, uh, for the smaller towns, uh, it's very expensive to uh, to electrify the lines because it's not only the electric uh, overhead cables, uh, it's also changing bridges or building new bridges or changing tunnels, building new tunnels, and that is very, very expensive. And if Germany continues to invest uh, at the rate that they're investing now to electrify the trains, uh, it's about a 230 million euros per year they're spending. It would take over 95 years to electrify. But on top of that, there are restrictions for the diesel trains coming ever even more and more hard or more difficult, just like for the trucks and buses. They're going from Euro 5 to Euro 6, Euro 7 coming up. And uh, it's becoming very difficult, ex uh, ex expansive. The noise is too much. Uh, the neighbors are complaining, so they want always more quiet trains. And it's getting progressively more difficult to, keep the, to, to make the trains more uh, quiet. Um, and they're also expecting the price of diesel in the next uh, five to ten years to really go up high, and uh, they, they need other solutions. That's a really good long answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, as far as the markets, uh, is, uh, is U.S. a big market for you guys? Yes. Um, we're based in Canada. Actually, I'd have to say Canada is a very small market for us. Uh, so the U.S., there's a lot of activity in California and in uh, Hawaii. 
Uh, and in Hawaii, uh, there's a co-location of an Air Force base and a naval base, so that's very strategic. So the Pearl Harbor and Hickam Air Force Base. And there are quite a number of different uh, vehicles there, buses, trucks, uh, aircraft, uh, tuggers, uh, material handling vehicles, fueling stations, and so on, and we, we provided a, quite, a, quite a large uh, percentage of that equipment there. Uh, but also in California, uh, there are buses, uh, fueling stations, and uh, the two main uh, applications in, in uh, California for us with this uh, product here, that uh, the Celerity in front of me, uh, is a fuel cell bus. We have a project with a new flyer, uh, to combine this unit with the uh, Siemens Drive in, uh, in the new fire uh, fuel cell bus. And uh, the other is also in the harbor of uh, Los Angeles and Long Beach. They're two huge, they're the biggest harbors of, of the U.S., side by each. And uh, most of the smog pollution in L.A. is actually coming from the harbor, from, uh, from the big ships. And uh, the, uh, well, a good percentage of it. So it's also from the traffic around. So it's a very uh, a stressed area for non-attainment of uh, emissions. And uh, there are two or 3,000 trucks taking containers from the ships, cargo ships, to the rail yards, which is 25 uh, kilometers, uh, miles away. And uh, there's a lot of emissions for that. So we have a project also together with Siemens and Freightliner to convert uh, hundreds of those trucks into a fuel cell version. And in those trucks, even though they're going on the interstate uh, highway, uh, you only need a, three, a 30 kilowatt fuel cell. So it's a relatively small fuel cell because there's a lot of stop and go. And the battery is taking the main power to get the truck up to speed. And the fuel cell only needs to recharge the battery. So the engine can be quite uh, cost effective and, and small. It's also very high efficiency. And in the harbor, uh, neighboring is, uh, are a lot of refineries. So there's pipeline hydrogen. And so the truck, if the truck is relatively the same price with the California um, rebates that they have for zero emission vehicles, the business case is in fact uh, with the fuel. The diesel fuel is cheaper than, uh, sorry, the hydrogen fuel is cheaper than the diesel fuel uh, on an energy basis. So that's why there can be, an, uh, uh, there was a, a PO to uh, uh, a partner a company of ours for a hundred of these trucks. That's pretty, quite sizable. And uh, so can you make a, a um, business uh, case for the fuel cells? Uh, well, that's always, uh, depending on the market, uh, there are a lot of uh, dots to connect to put a whole business case together. And uh, so it's not just the, the cost of the engine or the vehicle, it's especially the cost of the fuel because that's the, uh, the long-term operating cost. And uh, so, that's one thing that makes hydrogen maybe a little bit more complicated to, uh, to be able to understand and explain because there are many sources uh, for the hydrogen energy. Uh, in the first place, it can be coming from natural gas, it could be coming from uh, petrochemical or, or byproduct hydrogen from uh, chemical processes. Um, the ideal case, of course, is if the, uh, the electricity to produce the hydrogen is coming from renewable energy, so from wind and solar, uh, then splitting water with an electrolyzer to make completely uh, zero emission fuel. Uh, but uh, if you're just doing it based on the cost of a, the electricity from the grid, uh, electricity on an energy basis costs more than natural gas. So it's going to be difficult to compete with, uh, uh, especially where natural gas is a very popular and, and installed in vehicles. But where the business case uh, can really be coming from is the need f for storing energy. So the more wind and solar energy we have on the grid, which is very intermittent, and uh, many times you have too much energy that the grid can't take, or if you have a storm or a lot of high wind, uh, they actually have to put brakes on the wind turbines, and they're not rec reclaiming or capturing the full energy from that investment. That energy could go, in fact, to create fuel uh, for vehicle fleets. Uh, and uh, so instead of of uh, giving or not even capturing that energy, 
or a lot of times if there's too much energy on the grid, uh, the country uh, or province or state has to give the energy away to the neighbors. Sometimes in, in Germany it happens we have to pay Denmark to take the power. They don't want the power but Germany can't handle it so we have to pay them so the price goes negative. If you could just take that instead and make your own fuel, uh, it's, it's a perfect uh, situation. And what about uh, any other uh, sort of way to drive the, the price down, say in like in vehicles and such? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, with vehicles, of course, it's all about uh, volume, and for fueling stations, uh, the bigger the station, the lower the cost is per kilogram. So really, instead of going for the cars at first, it should be bigger fleets like buses, because a bus uses 20 kilograms every day, 365 days a year. A fleet of 100 buses is 2,000 kilograms. For a station operator, that's a, that's a more attractive customer than cars. Many small cars, you have to put fueling stations everywhere. You never know how many are coming per day. So a fleet of um, 100 buses is two tons per day of hydrogen. That's five megawatts for an electrolyzer. And we have that technology today. And uh, in fact, the plan and where the electrical utilities really get interested is when we're talking about 50 megawatts or 100 megawatts. 50 megawatts from an electrolyzer produces enough fuel for 1,000 buses. And 1,000 buses is, is the size of fleet for uh, most of the major cities in, in Europe. And a 50 megawatt uh, electrolyzer plant is actually quite small for a, a city to be able to fuel all their vehicles while storing energy from the grid and uh, it's zero emission, uh, it, it couldn't be a better situation. Thank you. And uh, anything else that you'd like to share, you know, sort of like a last thought that you want uh, for people to leave here with? Uh, well, actually on this, this topic I was just talking about uh, large fleets, uh, some of the cities like Hamburg, uh, London, uh, Oslo, they're planning a larger fleet installations and right now the next step is uh, 100 uh, fuel cell buses. Hamburg is, is planning to be one of the first, uh, maybe even in the, sometime in the next two years. And uh, we have a study together with uh, many of these cities I mentioned and the gas suppliers like uh, uh, Linda Gas and Air Products, uh, electrolyzer manufacturers like Hydrogen, Hydrogenics, uh, Siemens, uh, ITM. Uh, we're all working on this feasibility study to put out the information that the cities need to uh, pre prepare the tenders for the acquisition of these large uh, fueling stations. Yeah, so we're hoping that uh, there are going to be fleets of hundreds and thousands of fuel cell buses taking Hamburg again by 2020. They will only have zero emission buses. Uh, and uh, then that's making the way for, uh, for the trucks. It could be uh, 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 waste management trucks. And the cities who have a, lot, a number of the Stadtwerke, uh, city works in, uh, in Germany, they not only run the bus fleets, they have the power plants uh, operated. Uh, they are, uh, have their own gas network. They have their own um, renewable energy and, and storage, energy storage systems. So if they can be uh, taking the waste management, say gar uh, garbage, incinerating the garbage, making the power, storing it into uh, energy fuel, they can fuel their own bus fleets and uh, be safe, self-sustainable, not have to buy fuel from outside. And uh, so that's what's coming in a European study that we're doing together with these partners. And uh, some of those reports will be starting to come out uh, towards the end of this year. So we're looking very much uh, forward to the, to the results of that study. That's great. That's end of the year is uh, really good. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, Mark uh, Kammerer from Hydrogenics. And uh, you can visit him at um, just at that booth over there. And the number is uh, C65, just behind us over there. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. And thank you for yeah. joining us for this. Thanks, so Robin. up next, thank you. We have uh, my colleague is coming up. Thank you. Uh, with uh, Dr. Achim Chad, uh, head of department at uh, Fraunhofer. Institute for Solar Energy and Systems, ISE. Thank you.